All right, good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you this morning. Um, our mission moment this morning just remind, reminded me of, you know, why we're here. You know, we're here to come together as believers in Jesus, to grow in our relationship with Jesus, to understand his love for us, to um, engage in his mission and to share his love with other people. And so, um, I mean, when we do our mission moment up here, just know that the, the reason we do that is, number one, we want you to know things that we're a part of so that you can connect with those, but also to encourage you and to, to maybe challenge you. Like Isaiah 117 house, um, that whole ministry here in Jacksonville came about just from really Danae and Carl, them taking a step into uh, the ministry of, of foster care and seeing a need. And, uh, you know, my wife and I, we're, we're, we're part of uh, the, the foster system, and, and we see that need on removal day. And, and I'm going to tell you, it's heartbreaking. And when you see those things that, you know, are heartbreaking for us, and then you realize those are things that break the heart of God, and then you read in the Bible that, that pure religion is taking care of widows and orphans in their distress, and then you see in front of you an opportunity to do something, and, and, and then you, you, know, you ask yourself the question at times, like, you know, how can this ever change, or what's going to happen, who's going to do something, and then maybe in one of those quiet moments that you hear God say, maybe it's you. You know, and so when we come together, I just want to make sure that we understand um, when we come together, I hope you don't come, you know, just to, to come together and, and go to church or to, to hear a message that hopefully encourages you and inspires you or, um, you know, to have some experience in this room with a group of people who maybe you don't ever interact with outside of this. But I hope you come together really expecting the God who is alive to speak to you to encourage you and challenge you to remind you why you're alive to engage in his mission. And so when we go through a study like this, we're going through the book of Luke, as we go through, it's not to just learn more of the Bible and get good in our theology. It's to listen to God. Like, God, what are you saying to us? We're called to be followers of Jesus. We're studying the life of Jesus. What does it mean when we see Jesus doing these things and interacting? And, and, and what does it mean for me? How does that cause me and inspire me to, to follow Jesus and be a part of what he's doing? And who knows, he might use you to do something miraculous and life-changing in this world. In fact, I believe he will. I believe he wants to. You don't have to be the next Billy Graham or Mother Teresa to be a part of change in the world, Right? There was someone who prayed for Billy Graham. There was someone who prayed for Mother Teresa, and we don't know any of their names. But God wants to use us, and I just want to encourage us with that this morning as we jump into the book of Luke. We started last week, a lot of background. Um, you'll notice this sermon series slide, very detailed, all this like crazy stuff going on. Each one of these little icons stands for a chapter, and the reason I chose that slide is because Luke is like super detailed in his gospel. He tells us things about Jesus that we don't find anywhere else. He, he says that he set out to uh, basically investigate the life and ministry of Jesus, and he writes this account for this guy, Theophilus, which we don't know really anything about Theophilus, uh, other than the fact that uh, his name didn't make the most popular baby names in 2022, okay? It's one thing we know about him, but we don't know a lot about this guy. We just know that, that Luke wrote this for him so that Theophilus would know that the things he was taught about Jesus were true, okay? So that's why he writes this account. So I want to just say this morning, if you want to be certain about what you have been taught and what you know about Jesus, then study the book of Luke. You know, come on Sunday mornings and hear this, but read it on your own. Get into it. Read chapter by chapter. Start to digest it. As we talked about last week, this was a very dark time for the people of Israel they haven't heard um, prophetically from God in 400 years. There's been no prophet that has spoken. The last really word that they got from God was in Malachi 4. It's recorded in verses 5 through 6. Malachi writes this, Look, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. So the Israelites, they receive this prophetic word, and then God's silent. 
for 400 years. And we talked about last week, we said, you know, when, in times when God is silent, don't mistake in his silence for his absence or indifference. So he's silent for 400 years, but he's working. He's still moving. And, and know that in your life at times where you feel like, God, where are you? He's at work. Okay, we might not see it. We might not know exactly what he's doing, but he is at work. And so we see now that the, the prophecy that Malachi spoke 400 years earlier is about to come to pass, and we're introduced to a priest. His name is Zechariah, or some versions say Zacharias, same guy. Um, Zechariah is a priest, and as we're introduced to him, his, his order, his group, is on duty at the temple. Now, just to let you know kind of about priests in that day, there is somewhere in the neighborhood of 18,000 priests at this time, okay? Zechariah is chosen by lot, and I don't know exactly how this works, but it had to do with the, the belief in the sovereignty of God, God's providence, and they would take these lots and they would cast them to see which one fell a certain way, and that would be the person who God selected. They believed that God was in control of that. Well, Zechariah, his lot is what, um, what comes up. Now, 18,000 priests, his order is on duty during this time. He is being chosen to go into the temple, into the holy place to burn incense on the altar uh, of incense to represent the prayers of the people. This happened 14 times a year, so in 10 years you got 140 out of the 18,000 priests who get an opportunity to do this. So it's kind of a big deal. Zechariah goes in, he goes to offer the prayers for the people, burn the incense, People are outside praying, and we pick it up in Luke 1, verses 11 through 25. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him, but the angel said, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I am old, I'm an old man now, and my wife is also along in years. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was, it was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you'll be silent and unable to speak until the child is born, for my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized from his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterward, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it speaks to us. I pray that this morning you would help us to consider what you would say to each one of us individually. God, that by your spirit, somehow, some way, mysteriously and miraculously, you would speak to us. Give us ears to listen, God. Thank you that you would include us in a part of what you want to do in this world. And God, we want to join you in what you're doing. So speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> so Zechariah goes into the sanctuary, and he has an encounter. He's visited by an angel. We talked about this last week. Uh, not just any angel, but this is the angel Gabriel. He's the same one who will appear to Mary and announce the, that she's going to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit, okay? <clears throat> so Gabriel appears to 
Zechariah. Zechariah is overwhelmed. I mean, he is, he is just shaken. He's shook. He is, he's just like, you know, I mean, just imagine this, okay? I mean, we all have these ideas of angels, right? Like, you see it in, in movies, commercials. I always like that Capital One from years ago, that, that angel commercial where, like, the one angel comes and the guy's uh, always, he's about to have something really bad happen. The angel comes and saves him. And then, then you have the other guy who, like, every time something bad's about to happen, it happens because his angel's, like, over here smoking a cigarette or something. Like, and he's got, the, he's got the angel who's just not paying attention to anything. Listen, angels are real. They're here, we don't see them. I mean, I believe there's, a, there's a, a hidden realm that is as real as this realm, and it's all around us. Angels, demons, okay? And so, very different than what we see probably in most movies. So just imagine if God all of a sudden kind of peels back this realm and someone from that realm steps into this realm in your bedroom, let's say, in the middle of the night. You'd be freaking, right? You would. And so Zachariah, that's kind of what happens here. He's just, he's astounded at what happens. And, and, and you can imagine how you would react. But this is Gabriel, okay? He's not an archangel, but we find him mentioned a number of times in the scripture. The last time he is mentioned is in the book of Daniel, and he speaks to Daniel regarding this vision that Daniel had. Daniel had a, he had a dream and he couldn't figure out what it meant. Gabriel comes and tells him what the dream means. Okay, so check out, after he tells him kind of what the dream is, this is Daniel's response, Daniel 8, verses 17 to 18. As Gabriel approached the place where I was standing, I became so terrified that I fell with my face to the ground. Son of man, he said, you must understand the events you have seen in your vision relate to the time of the end. While he was speaking, I fainted and laid with my face to the ground. But Gabriel roused me with a touch and helped me to my feet. So Zechariah is not alone just being shook. I mean, this is what it's like when you see an angel, okay? An awesome experience. Daniel is just shaken to his core. He's just face down. Gabriel helps him up. Gabriel appears to Daniel again. And he proceeds to explain what's going to happen in the future. Daniel 9, verses 20 to 26. I went on praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, pleading with the Lord, my God of Jerusalem, his holy mountain. As I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me at the time of evening sacrifice. He explained to me, Daniel, I've come here to give you insight and understanding. The moment you began praying, a command was given. And now I'm here to tell you what it was, for you are very precious to God. Listen carefully so that you can understand the meaning of your vision. A period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. Now, listen and understand Seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with the streets and strong defenses despite perilous times. After this period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. And, the, and a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. The end will come with a flood, and war and its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. All right. I don't want to get bogged down in all the algebra here, okay? Uh, you know, seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven. All right, but there's a few things that I want to make sure that we get out of this passage. First, you'll notice that when Gabriel speaks to Daniel, he says, at the moment you started praying, a command was given. Look at verse 23. The moment you began praying, a command was given. And now I am here to tell you what it was, for you are very precious to God. Listen carefully so that you can understand the meaning of your vision. I mean, how cool is that? Daniel starts to pray 
And Gabriel says, as soon as you started praying, a command was given. It, this, is, this is just awesome to me because what, what God's doing here is he's giving us a little bit of a window into that unseen realm we were talking about. Daniel's down here praying. He gives us a window to what's going on up there. As soon as you were praying, God gave a command. That to me is awesome. And he goes, you're precious in God's sight. And as awesome as that is, man, it's really convicting for me. I mean, it's I, I, as I was reading this and studying this and just thinking about this, I was like, man, we've been given, I've been given this incredible privilege to go before God at any moment, any time because of what Jesus has done. I can, I can come into God's presence, so to speak, make my requests known, and when I do that, things happen. Now, I'm not saying every time you pray, God's going to shout out a command, like, hey, take care of that, dude. Like, I'm not saying that that's what happens every time. But it happened this time. And, da and Daniel's not the only one who's precious to God. I mean, throughout Scripture, over and over, we find out you're precious to God. He shows you how much he loves you through the cross. And so, as I think about it, I'm like, man... So many times I forsake this awesome privilege that I have for meaningless things that don't have any eternal consequence. It made me think of this quote from C.S. Lewis. He said, we're half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. Far too easily pleased and distracted. What he's saying is we get, we settle for these base things that this world has to offer that really in the end are meaningless. And there's so much more in our relationship with the Lord. There's so much more life that he desires to give us and wants us to be a part of. And we settle for so much less. Think about it. We're invited into a relationship with the king of the universe. Like you're invited to, to sit at his table, if you will, to speak to him, to make your requests known. And he's listening, not just to appease you or me, but he, he desires to move on our behalf when it's in the best interest of his kingdom and his people. I mean, what would you do if you had that kind of audience with the president of the United States? Don't answer that question, Okay. <laughs> It might open up a can of worms. But, I mean, think about that. If you were invited into a place like that to say anything you wanted, to ask any questions, I mean, what would you do? We would all take advantage of that. No matter what you thought about that person in power, we would all take advantage of that because it's an awesome, awesome privilege. We've been given such a greater privilege. And we all, myself included, neglect that. God hears Daniel's prayer, he gives a command, and he sends Gabriel to him. Gabriel's explaining to Daniel what's going to happen in the future, and without getting into all the seven sets, 62 sets, all that stuff, he's laying out a timeline for the coming of the anointed one. Verse 26, after this period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. And a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. He's telling him what's going to happen. This all happened. He's telling him about the coming of the Messiah. So it's only fitting that Gabriel, the one who's telling Daniel this, is now the one who shows up to Zechariah. And what's interesting is what Gabriel says to Zechariah. Look at verse 13 of Luke chapter 1. But the angel said... Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your what? God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you're to name him John. God has heard your prayer. He's listening. He is acting on your behalf. God is giving Zechariah and Elizabeth a son. Their son is to be named John. We know he is John the Baptist. He is the one who is going to usher in God's plan to announce the coming of the anointed one, the Messiah, that was prophesied through Daniel. And John will be the one to fulfill what was prophesied in Malachi. 
400 years earlier. He ends the silence. The silence will be ended through John, John the Baptist, the prophet. So he's like, listen, Zechariah, you're going to have a son, and you're going to name him John. And I mean, just imagine, he goes, they, they, she was barren. They're in their later years. They're old, beyond childbearing years. And so now there's a promise. And, and I mean, this would be a proud, this should be like a proud dad moment. And look at what Zechariah's response is, Luke 1.18. Zechariah said to the angel, how can, I be sure, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. So what does Zechariah do in response to the angel's promise? He questions God. He's like, how, how am I going to know this is going to happen? Now listen, I'm no spiritual giant. I'm not the smartest guy in the room. But if an angel shows up in my room telling me God sent him and this is what's going to happen, I'm probably believing him. All right? Zechariah. And I don't know about you, but this really encourages me. Because not only does God use ordinary people, he uses foolish people. He uses ridiculous people like Zechariah. I mean, seriously. The, the angel Gabriel shows up and he's like, I need some more proof. And you got you to gotta love Gabriel's response, right? Then the angel said, dude, I am Gabriel. Okay, he doesn't say dude, but he goes, I'm Gabriel. I, stand, I mean, just listen to the response. I stand in the presence of God every day, okay? And, and it's, he's the one who sent me to give you this good news. Are you serious right now? And he's probably like, God, are you serious right now? Like, this is the best you got down here? And Gabriel's like, all right. I, he, I, I, I'm, I'm really speculating here and expounding, but he's probably like, all right, Zachariah, listen, that was a real dumb thing. I'm not going to kill you, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you, I'm going to put you in timeout, okay? Because that's basically what happens to Zechariah as we read. I mean, he, he puts him in timeout. It's like verse 20. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you'll be silent, unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be, fill, be fulfilled at the proper time knucklehead. Um, no. I, um, now listen, I will admit, if you know anything about me, if you read the book I wrote, if you didn't know I wrote a book, but if you just know me, you know, I'm the guy who's like, listen, question everything. Question leaders, question church structure, question theology, if it doesn't sit right with you. Questions are good, okay? However, there's one thing we should not question. And it's the word of God when it is very clear and explicit, all right? Now, there's things that have been debated for a thousand years, and those will still be debated, right? And it's okay to question those things. It's okay for us to be different in those areas. But when things are clear, we need to stand firm on the truth that we have, all right? At Emmaus, we say we seek unity in the essential beliefs, we value liberty and non-essential beliefs, and we pursue love in all things, which is one of the things I really, really love about this community of believers is it's very diverse in many, many ways, and, and theologically, okay? We're not as diverse as I'd like us to be, but God values diversity, and we should as well. And so if there's things that, that are not essential, like we're not talking about is Jesus the Messiah, is he the son of God? Did he die and raise from the dead? Okay, we'd say, yeah, that's essential. But these other things, like how he's going to return, what's that going to be like, you know, are you free will or predestinate? Like, like those things, we can have those discussions, but we should not break fellowship over those things. We should not lose relationships over those things. We should be able to come together and worship God together and express love to one another. So we don't have to agree about every little theological detail, but we do need to stand without compromise on the truths that are clearly expressed in God's Word. So we don't have to redefine sin and start saying what the Bible says is bad, and, you know, isn't bad, and what the Bible says, you know, is good and right, isn't right. We can't let culture start influencing us, right? 
We have to stand on what we know is true. But even when we stand on those truths that we'd say are unshakable, that the Bible clearly defines, we do that in a loving way. Right? We should always do that in a loving way with one another here and people we encounter out there. Zechariah, he questions God's word through the angel. And there's consequences for that. Thankfully, they're just short term. He won't be able to speak until John's born. Look at verses 21 to 25. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized from his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterward, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. All right, so Zechariah comes out. Everybody realizes something's wrong. Like, he must have seen a vision. I mean, he, again, when this all happens, he is shaken in there. Now he comes out and he can't talk, and you can imagine him trying to explain what's going on to the people. Plus, when the, when the priest would come out, they would usually um, give a blessing to the people as they would send them off, like a benediction of sorts. So he's not able to do that. So he's trying to communicate. It's, it's probably a pretty hilarious scene, right? Like Bible charades at its best. He's out there just trying to tell them what happened, and, you know, they're like, okay, three words, this first one. No, I don't know how they did it, but, you know, he's out there just trying to let them know something happened, right? And he's not able to speak. And when you think about this for a minute, you know, Elizabeth, when you hear the story, she's super excited. Like, God has taken away my disgrace. She's super excited. She's going to have a child, even though she's old. So she's super excited. Zachariah is unable to speak. And then soon we realize, wow, this punishment may be a little worse than we thought at the beginning. Because for nine months, all he can do is listen to his wife and her excitement. And she wins every argument. And he just has to sit there. <laughs> Some of the ladies go, that's the way it should be anyhow, right? Um, <laughs> so, I mean, men, just remember, there are consequences for not believing in God's word, all right? And you want to avoid those. But look at what she says. How kind the Lord is, she explained, exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. Now, it's important. There's a couple things here that are important to understand. During this time, the way that most people viewed um, sickness, physical ailments, um, even disabilities, deformities, their mindset was this has happened because someone sinned, either that, that person or someone in the family. That was kind of their mindset. Now, what we're going to see when we go through the book of Luke is Jesus is kind of going to blow that up, and he's going to teach them something. He's going to show them that that's not the case. But it starts right here, because people would have thought that Elizabeth, because she is barren and not able to have children, has been in some way, for some reason, cursed by God. She's not able to be fruitful and multiply as, as the command is given. And so there's some secret sin or something causing her barrenness. So not only is God going to fulfill his promise to deliver his people, not only is he about to break the silence through the prophet uh, that, that they're going to have, their child John, he chooses to do this through a woman who is barren and has probably been scorned for her whole life. And after a lifetime of disgrace and scorn, she proclaims how kind the Lord is. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. I want you to think about that. Imagine going through your entire life. You're in your 70s. I don't know, maybe 80. People have disgraced you. You've been scorned. You've been looked at. Like people think, man, there's like a black cloud overhead. Some, there's something wrong with them. And you deal with that your whole life. And then God comes and gives her a promise and it's like that promise from God, what, what's happening in that moment, it shatters all of that, and she's able to go, man, how kind the Lord is. It's almost like she has, she has a, um, an idea of 
how short this life is compared to eternity, how blessed it is to be a part of God's plan, even if it's only for the last few years of her life, right? How kind the Lord is. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. May we never forget the kindness of God. She was included in his plan. Took her a long time to realize that. But listen, you're including, included in his plan. I'm included in his plan. I'm not up here proclaiming like Gabriel that God's going to give you a child who's going to be a prophet. I'm just telling you what I know from the scripture. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. That he told us that he wants us to be disciples who make disciples, to be followers of, of his who would encourage other people to follow him, that he would give us his Holy Spirit who would live in us and be with us, that he would do powerful, even miraculous things through us for his glory, that he wants to build his kingdom and he does it through his people. This thing called the church, it's not a building, it's not a place we sit in, it's who you are, it's who I am, and we represent Jesus to the world. We're a light that shines in this dark place. You're a part of that story. I'm a part of that story. We're all included. We cannot forget the kindness of God. Look at Titus chapter 3, verses 3 to 7. Once we too were foolish and disobedient, we were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth, and a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Man, there's so much here. I mean, there's a whole sermon in this passage, but I want us to see a few things. He's revealed his kindness and his love. He saved us, not because of how good we were, he goes, no, we were foolish, disobedient, gave ourselves over to many lusts and pleasures. We hated each other. No, it wasn't because of his goodness that he saved us, or it wasn't because of our goodness that he saved us. It's because of his goodness. It's not about how good you are. It's about how good he is. And through Christ, we all can receive eternal life. Everybody's invited in. Everybody's included. Everybody's a part of his plan. Ephesians 2, 4 to 7, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by grace that you've been saved for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we're, re we're united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages and examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. When he raised Jesus from the dead, he raised us from the dead. It's through Jesus' life, his resurrected life, that we can have life, that we can be delivered from our sins and move from being dead to being alive. Levi, you guys can come back up. His kindness has been shown to us in Christ Jesus. I'm just trying to get us to see how kind God is and to see it all through Scripture just the way Elizabeth saw it. Romans 2, 4. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? It's his kindness that leads to repentance, some translations say here. Now, remember that first and foremost for yourself. It's God's kindness that draws you to him and leads you to repentance. Some people try to, you know, some people think that you just you need to tell people of God's judgment, punishment, get them to fear hell so that they will give their lives to God. And while I think that that might scare somebody and might get someone to make a decision, I don't know how real, honest, and 
life-changing that is. It can be. But I know the scripture says it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. It's his kindness that gets us to turn to him. Like, I know, I know who I am and I know who I was. I'm still a sinner, but man, I was a really bad sinner <laughs> before coming to know Jesus. And, and to know that God, who created me, still loved me that way and that he would actually die for me, like that there was some value in my life. You know what they say, that the, the value of something is, is the price someone's willing to pay for it, right? And God says, this is how much I value you, and he gave his life for you. And, and, and so knowing his love, knowing his grace, knowing his kindness, it's like how can I not just give my life back to him? How can I not desire to follow him? How can I not... How can I not love him enough because after he's first loved me to just say, yes, I want to honor you? Are we going to do that perfectly? No. But just understand this. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. It's his kindness that turns us from our sins. And I say that to say this, and I'm going to wrap up in just a second. Remember that for yourself, and please remember that for the people out there. Please remember that for the people who you meet out there at your job, at your school, in your neighborhood, the HOA committee. <laughs> you know, I mean, wherever you, just remember that for the people who you meet out there who appear to be very far from Jesus and are living lives that don't line up with God's word. Remember that it's the kindness of God that draws. And, and God has shown that to you and he wants you to show that, he wants to show that to others and, and he wants that to flow from you. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, why are so many Christians or some Christians so mean? I'd say probably because they don't know Jesus. I know that's probably really judgmental of me, talking about judgmental people that way. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, because when I look at the life of Jesus, it doesn't look like that, you know? So, so they must not really know him. Now, I'm not saying I don't have my moments. We all have our moments, right? But I'm talking about people who are just religious and mean. And they want to tell you how bad you are and how wrong you are and how quick you're headed to hell. They may be real religious. I'm not sure that they're disciples of Jesus. All right, let me close with this. Galatians 5, 22 to 23, because this is what it says about disciples of Jesus. This is what he tells us happens with disciples of Jesus. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience. What's the next one? Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. So what I want to pray for us this morning is that we know and understand the kindness of God, receiving his love, receiving his grace, and, and are in a place where we are extending that to other people, joining him in what he's doing. I mean, the Messiah has come. The anointed one has come. It's good news for all people. And now he's given us that good news to share. And I pray that he'll share that through each one of us. If you'd stand with me, I want to pray for us. We're going to sing one last song this morning. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that as we read it, there's just so much truth and so many things that we could relate to. You can read a story and on the surface just like just skim by it, but there's so many things we can relate to from you using broken people, people who we can just see our lives in. Lord, it's amazing to think that you'd use people like us to be a part of what you want to do in this world. God, would you fill us with your spirit? Would that fruit just be born within us and come out of us, that love, patience, peace, kindness, gentleness, self-control? God, may that be what marks our lives. May that be what people see. And when they think of your church, they start to think of these things rather than what they think of now. Because we are your church. God, thank you for your love and grace. May we never forget your kindness that you extended to us. Help us to extend that to others, we pray in Jesus' name.